There is emerging scientific evidence that the universe itself may possess some kind of intelligence. Indeed, every nebula, every galaxy, every star and planet and galactic cluster appear to be connected in a way that resembles a brain. And we see this even when we consider our own Milky Way galaxy, a beautiful red-centered spiral now coming into view, which could be likened to a neuron. Every structure in the universe seems to play some role in this cosmic manifestation of a brain. We see those connections in everything, whether we are observing a star cluster, the remnant core of a galaxy long since absorbed by our Milky Way, and now passing through the very heart of the Milky Way, or whether we are looking upon clouds of stardust that form the filaments that join the galaxies like axons. Here, we approach the Eagle Nebula, which holds the beautiful structure known as the Pillars of Creation. And the Eagle Nebula is a mother, a birthplace of stars. And the varicolored gases you see all around us? This is the essence of stars and planets yet born. Nearly five billion years ago, such stardust collapsed and formed our own solar system. And below us, we see the star that almost was, Jupiter. And a little closer to the center of our star system, we find ourselves traversed in the spectacle of the Marineris Valley, a Martian canyon so huge it could swallow the expanse of entire nations on Earth. Each of these places so far apart in time and space are inexorably connected. But no matter where we look throughout the entire universe, whether among the incomprehensibly huge structures among the far depths of intergalactic space, or within the mist-veiled depths of the Marineris Valley upon a sunrise, there is nowhere that we know in the universe that is a richer cradle of that elusive precious thing called intelligence than our own dear and familiar Earth. A peculiar blue world orbited by an immense moon large enough to be a small planet in its own right, both of which spiral about a small yellow star which would appear entirely unremarkable among the hundreds of billions of others throughout our galaxy. The strange two-legged hominids that dwell upon that world and currently dominate it often reckon themselves to be the pinnacle of intelligence. A magic mirror told them so. But perhaps, just perhaps, we might venture down to that odd blue world and discover a much deeper truth. For just as it seems that the universe may in fact shape itself for intelligence, an intelligence of a nature and kind that we can barely wrap our minds around at this time, so it might be that upon that strange little blue world, that among its multitudinous life forms, there are intelligences far stranger, more varied and wondrous than what those odd and somewhat self-focused hominids dare allow themselves to believe. This amazing footage could almost be interpreted as time-lapse video of the developments of the human brain, and yet it is anything but. Rather, this video portrays the developments of the early universe beginning at 0.4 billion years of age. This was an embryonic era of the universe, when the stuff from which it is made, matter and energy, and prospectively dark matter and dark energy, were collapsing into webs and nodes, which, at about 4.5 billion years of development, began to take on a certain life as stars matured and developed, and signals began to pass between the galaxies, very much resembling the movements of energy between neurons and axons, the primary structures of brain cells. There is, at this time, no certain proof that the universe is intelligent, but there is an uncanny resemblance between the very structure of intelligence, the brain, and the structures the universe itself is assuming. This should come as no surprise. Nature, even here upon this small earth, has shown in so many ways that it wants to be aware. We have learned that forests are aware and shape the world they live in. We have learned that trees and many animals communicate in what might truly and fairly only be called language, perhaps not with spoken words, but language nonetheless. The ancients had a saying, as above, so below, and it means that the patterns we see in one place tend to repeat in another. In many ways, modern science would appear to bear that out, something we perceive as we observe the structures of the universe coming together in such a way that they resemble the most sophisticated and complex instrument known, the human brain. Convergence evolution appears to push the stuff of the universe in the direction of intelligence. But is this intelligence aware? While we now know of a certainty that trees themselves communicate, that ravens have a language, 
that wolves interact in complex social groups where each individual's wants and goals, purpose and place are mediated through body language and vocalizations. And I could go on and on, ad infinitum. Plants and animals communicate, and the universe appears to organize itself with purpose, both of which imply intelligence. But the great question is, does this appearance of intelligence, this organization and structure, goal and direction-driven behavior, do these things indicate the holy grail of self-awareness? It is, in fact, a valid question, and a computer represents a great example of why. A computer is nothing other than a vast collection of microscopic transistors that share information in the form of electrical pulses, and so a computer's output might appear structured and purposed. And so one might argue that a computer presents intelligence, but a computer presents no evidence of self-awareness whatsoever. Turn on your computer, leave it on and walk away. Stay away for a hundred years. The computer will not engage in any activity. It will simply operate, its cursor blinking, taking no initiative, presenting no imagination, failing to interact in any way with its environment. Pick up a hammer and threaten to smash that computer to smithereens and the computer will not care one way or another. Even the holy grail of computer programming, artificial intelligence, gives only an illusion of awareness, the application only leading a computer to react in the organized ways which it has been pre-directed by the programmers. The application imitates intelligence, but does not present any initiative, imagination, or awareness of its own. But what is self-awareness? This vaunted thing we humans value so highly in ourselves and seek among other creatures, like consciousness, it is poorly defined. If we turn to the Internet's most quintessential source of information, Wikipedia, we discover, right at the beginning of an article on what is consciousness, the following words. Consciousness, at its simplest, is, quotation marks, sentience or awareness of internal or external existence, end quotation marks. And the proceeding sentence, Despite centuries of analyses, definitions, explanations, and debates by philosophers and scientists, consciousness remains puzzling and controversial, being at once the most familiar and most mysterious aspect of our lives. My scientific background is psychology, and I chose to focus many years ago upon studying the presentation of consciousness wherever it might be found. Hallmark features of consciousness are aspects that I mentioned earlier, things like the ability to take initiative, and have an imagination, and hold to desires, and goals, and aspirations, not merely to mate, but to seek out love and connection with the people that we care about, with the creatures that surround us, with the universe at large, and even the numinous. The problem with defining consciousness is that all those elements that I have just described are ideas, ideas that themselves defy precise definition, and yet must be used to define an even more encompassing and ambiguous idea, that of consciousness. And no matter where we look, in the brain, or the body, or the world around us, we cannot seem to find this thing called consciousness. We know it is there, a ghost in the machine that we cannot put our fingers upon. But perhaps those two words that I just spoke, we know, are the pure distillate of the idea of consciousness. We know. We are aware. The idea of self-awareness. For that is truly what differentiates living consciousness from machines. No matter how sophisticated the artificial intelligence is, it only imitates awareness. Living beings have feelings, drives, dreams. They are not merely responding to the environment around them. They are self-motivated, and thus they are aware of themselves. We humans have a great certainty that we are self-aware, yet just like consciousness, we can barely define it. Though I find it interesting that while we have tremendous difficulty defining both what consciousness is and what self-awareness is, we feel fairly certain in our assessment, at least in Western paradigms of science and philosophy, that neither animals, nor plants, nor the inanimate world possess any meaningful form of consciousness nor self-awareness and a pillar of our belief in our fairly unique position as self-aware conscious beings was, as I mentioned earlier, a magic mirror, Gallup's mirror. Gordon Gallup is a senior university professor at the State University of New York in Albany. 
He received his PhD in 1968 from Washington State University and later joined the staff at Tulane University before taking on a position with the University of New York. Over the many years of his long career, Gallup has done research in tonic immobility in animals, ethological approaches to the study of animal behavior under laboratory conditions, and human evolutionary psychology. But despite a distinguished career at his field, Gallup is most known for the mirror self-recognition tests, otherwise known as the MSR. This test posits that evidence of self-recognition equals evidence of self-awareness, and the test can be done in two ways. One way is to study how an animal interacts with its reflection in a mirror. Animals in wild or laboratory conditions are presented a mirror, and observers note if their behavior indicates whether they come to understand, after a period of investigation, that the reflection is an image of themselves. Animals that understand this tend to demonstrate it through periods of self-exploration. However, the interpretation of the behaviors of the animals can be subjective. A more objective test was devised. The subject animal receives a harmless mark, such as a bit of paint on its fur or skin. Observers then watch to see whether the animal recognizes this difference and investigates it. And while there is still some subjectivity to this second method, results are much more predictable. In the above video, a harmless mark has been applied to the feathers of this magpie. The magpie has recognized the mark on itself and is trying to remove it. Over the decades since the mirror self-recognition test was developed by Gordon Gallup, many species have been trialed by it. Few pass. And if we are to accept the classic interpretation, this would indicate that very few species that share this world with we humans are truly self-aware, at least not by the high standards that we humans believe we can apply to ourselves. But, is there a crack in Gallup's mirror? Understanding whether this is so is crucial for it would wildly reframe how we must perceive the life of the natural world around us, and thereby how we must relate to it. Among the most telling evidence of the flaws in the mirror self-recognition test is the fact that some human children do not pass. In an article from the British Psychological Society Research Digest called Cross-Cultural Reflections on the Mirror Self-Recognition Test, it is noted that about 70% of Western children pass the MSR by the age of two. However, very often children from non-Western cultures fail to pass the test even by age six. The test administered was the classic MSR, whereupon a small mark was made on the child's body to see if the child would recognize and remove it. In this case, the mark was simply a post-it note affixed to the child's clothing. In Kenya, 80 out of 82 children simply froze when they saw the small note, but did not remove it. The test was also administered in Fiji, St. Lucia, Grenada, Peru, Canada, and the USA. The USA and Canada unsurprisingly scored the typical Western results. But in Peru and Grenada, only about half the children passed. And in Fiji, none of the children passed. So does this mean that non-Western children are developmentally behind Western children? That is extremely unlikely. Most likely, the reason that we are seeing the differences in the scores relates simply to culture. Western nations, the USA and Canada, are particularly individualistic. Persons are taught to identify themselves and distinguish themselves from others, and even not to follow the group or the crowd from a very early age. Whereas in many non-Western cultures, fitting in is emphasized. It is postulated that Western children, seeing the mark, made autonomous decisions to remove it, while non-Western children, upon seeing the mark, were unsure whether or not it was appropriate to remove it in context of the group. Thus, we see that even among our own species, there are a variety of reasons for which children may or may not pass the MSR. But one reason the MSR tends to work among all humans is that we are highly visually oriented. While humans do not have the best vision among all the creatures of the natural world, a huge portion of our brains is devoted to visual processing. Thus, we humans have an extraordinary ability to perceive what we see in the environment. Our excellent color and stereo vision makes us very good at picking out discrete objects even when they are camouflaged. We are exceedingly good at finding patterns in visual fields. And we are excellent at tracking moving objects among other objects even when the visual background is confusing. We'll come back to this later when I demonstrate the differences between the way humans and canines perceive visually with a simple experiment. Before we get to it though, 
I believe that it is important to note that many animals do not pass the MSR, I am certain, simply because they are not visually oriented. Many species of bats, for example, would perceive the world through their uniquely refined sense of echolocation. And in context of echolocation, a mirror would just be a flat plane within the environment. Bats do have eyes, and even if there was light to allow the bat to see its reflection in the mirror, the neural structure of an echolocating bat may very well incline the animal to prioritize how it thinks about the world around it through its sense of echolocation. There are species of insects that taste with their feet and hear with their wings. How differently might their own unique neural structures incline them to perceive the world? Would a mirror test mean anything to them at all? Trees can definitely perceive light, likely can perceive sound, certainly can sense the chemical structures within soil, a sense we might equate to taste, and yet, insofar as we can tell, they have no neurological structures within their bodies. But despite this, they interact successfully with their environments, modify their behavior accordingly, and communicate in complicated fashion with each other and through other species in the world around them. Might we rule them out as in some way self-aware, despite their certain lack of a response to the presentation of themselves in the reflection of a mirror? Thus, I posit that when it comes to understanding the natural world, the fundamental flaw with the mirror self-recognition test is that many creatures simply are not visually oriented. And I'm going to demonstrate this with an experiment with a dog. My dog, in fact, Gilly Doo, who is a border collie. Dogs, like their lupin ancestors, have excellent vision, a fact that was once demonstrated to me one evening when I took my dog outside to do his business before bed. The night had a quarter moon and was quite dark, and off to my right, only a few meters away, there was a porcupine at the edge of the cottage, on the north side in the shadows of the moonlight, and I could not see it at all. There was a steady breeze that evening downwind of us, and the trees of the spruce birch and poplar woods that surround the cottage were rustling in the wind. But the second we went outside, Gilly Doo turned his head and went immediately over to investigate, which had the unfortunate and predictable result that Gilly Doo ended up with a few quills in his mouth that I had to remove that evening. I had not at all been aware of the presence of the porcupine till Gilly Doo found it. And given that we were upwind of the porcupine, with the confusing background noise of the wind, which often leads keen-eared animals to be unable to properly acoustically interpret their environment, Gilly Doo became immediately aware of the porcupine, and I have no doubt whatsoever that despite the darkness of the moon shadow, he was able to see the porcupine, a conclusion I arrive at because of the way he turned his head and immediately fixated on it. Dogs have good eyes. But that is not merely my subjective impression. The visual capabilities of dogs, coyotes, and wolves has been well documented in scientific literature. But despite their good vision, dogs are not visually oriented. Their noses are the primary way they understand the world. Let's conduct a little experiment and demonstrate. The purpose of this experiment is to test the ability of domestic dogs to visually discriminate between objects in a complex field. I believe that this experiment will provide an excellent comparison and contrast between the ability of humans to discriminate visual objects and that of dogs. The methodology is simple and straightforward. A grassy yard provides a visually neutral background, and on one side of the yard, I will place a loose group of a dozen sticks made of spruce. Thus, each stick, handled and cut by me, will smell similar, so the dog, Gilly Doo, will not be able to distinguish them by smell. Each stick, though, does have a unique shape, which I believe we humans will perceive readily. Gilly Doo loves to play fetch with sticks, and if he misses the stick, he will search obsessively until he finds it and brings it back. However, I hypothesize that when the stick lands among this group of sticks, he will not be able to tell his stick from the other sticks. Because while each stick looks differently, they will smell similarly. And since his canine brain prioritizes smell, to him, they are all effectively indistinguishable. We will begin the experiment by demonstrating Gilly Doo's determination to find and bring back the stick he was thrown. Then we will change to a new stick so that there is no scent on it, and I'll throw this stick among the group. Then Gilly Doo will have to find it on his own. In this portion of the experiment, there are only two sticks at play. Both are conifer wood, derived from the same tree, so they both smell alike, or nearly so. As you can see here, Gilly Doo has no trouble bringing back the correct stick, the one that was thrown, 100% of the time. 
I should also note that I have trained Gilly Doo to bring back only the stick that I have thrown him, and he is a year and a half old and has received this training for over a year. He's very good at this task and like all Border Collies is obsessive about doing his job right. Let's complicate the visual field. This time, we're going to add five more sticks, making for a total of a half dozen, and we'll see if Gilly Doo begins to have trouble distinguishing one from the other. And right there, at the very first throw, he misses. To be more precise, he runs down the same plane that the stick traveled through the air, but overshoots it and goes for the similar smelling conifer twig a meter beyond it. I repeated the experiments under these conditions 24 more times for a total of 25. As long as the stick I was throwing landed near the six other sticks, Gilly Doo's chances of acquiring the correct stick were completely random, one in seven. Then I changed the conditions again and added another half dozen conifer sticks to the field, making the field even more visually confusing. Predictably, Gilly Doo had an even more difficult time distinguishing among the similar smelling sticks. Now here, I've changed the conditions yet again. This time I've gone and cut a stick off a nearby wild apple tree. This stick is dark brown and roughly similar to the conifer sticks, but it will have a distinctly difference in sweet smell. In fact, woodpeckers love to drill little holes in wild apple trees in spring when their sap starts flowing. The sap dribbles out of the tree and evaporates and then the woodpeckers come back later to eat the sugary droplets that condense. Here the stick is thrown. Now I tell Gilly Doo to bring it back. Notice how Gilly Doo self-corrected. I repeatedly threw the apple stick into the pile another nine times for a total of ten, and each time he retrieved the correct stick. And I repeated this experiment with a brown birch stick, which also looks similar to the conifer as a twig, but at this time of the year its sap has a wintergreen oil in it. And I repeated this experiment with a poplar stick. In all the above cases, when a different scented stick was used, Gilly Doo identified them correctly 100% of the time. And here he does it again. Though, I bet that you as a human had no trouble tracking where the sticks landed each time. In the above footage, taken last autumn, a year ago, Gilly Doo is having the same difficulty tracking the correct stick when it lands among similar smelling sticks in the woods. The point is straightforward. We humans are visually oriented, and we distinguish the world by the unique visual patterns and gestalts that we perceive. But while dogs may have good eyes, their brains are structured to prioritize distinguishing the world by scent. I am certainly not the first person to have observed the crack in Gallup's mirror. The test is distinctly anthropocentric, looking for self-awareness based on human senses and human standards of perception. In an article that appeared in 2017 in Science Daily, entitled, The Sniff Test of Self-Recognition Confirmed, Dogs Have Self-Awareness, we read these illuminating paragraphs. While domestic dogs, Canis familiaris, have been found to be skillful at social cognitive tasks and even some metacognitive tasks, they have not passed the test of mirror self-recognition, the MSR. Dr. Alexander Horowitz borrowed the pioneering ethological research called the Sniff Test of Self-Recognition, STSR, proposed by Professor Katsola Gatti in 2016 to shed light on different ways of checking for self-recognition and applied it to 36 domestic dogs accompanied by their owners. The study confirmed the previous evidence proposed with the STSR by Dr. Katsola Gatti, showing that dogs distinguish between the olfactory image of themselves when modified, investigating their own odor for longer when it had an additional odor accompanying it than when it did not. Such behavior implies a recognition of the odor as being of or from themselves. For multiple millennia, dogs have been man's best friend. Unlike every other animal that we know, they coordinate their behaviors to match ours and show through their behaviors that they understand ours, displaying sophisticated reasoning, social skills, and even empathy and abstract thought. So I find it entirely unsurprising to have canine self-awareness confirmed scientifically. Though, I also find it unsurprising that it took humans this long to accept it since at least the dawn of recorded history, humans have displayed an incredible need to perceive themselves as unique and above every other thing and even other people. And while I suspect that as time marches on and the crack in Gallup's mirror is explored further, ultimately leading to its breakage, we, mere humans, will discover that a great many other things are in fact self-aware. But perhaps the crack in Gallup's mirror tells us more about ourselves than it does about the world around us. 
It tells us that we perceived ourselves as the pinnacle of evolution, that we thought we knew the standards of the mind. And it reflects a deep need within us to be superior, a need that has spawned so much human misery in the form of greed, narcissism, and war and so much misery in the natural world in the form of endless and ruthless environmental devastation to fuel our perpetual quest for wealth and self-glorification. So it is perhaps that what the crack in Gallup's mirror tells us, above all else, is that while we can in fact scientifically confirm that we are self-aware, maybe we as a species have much evolving yet to do when it comes to wisdom. Thank you for watching. The Naturalist Program is committed to the reliable coverage of natural science and environmental issues. Please take a moment to subscribe. It costs nothing and never will, but it sure helps a lot.